Thanks, Kathleen, and welcome everybody. And well done. Here we are around the screen. We've sort of flipped between in person and screen, but I just think we decided this busy time of term, maybe it suited everyone a little bit better to log in from a distance. So we'll just do an acknowledgement of country first when Kathleen clicks that wonderful slide on for me. Awesome. Thanks, Kathleen. So we're just acknowledging that we're presenting from the lands of the Wathaurong people who are the traditional owners on the land on which my school's built and on which all of our schools um, are today. And we pay our respects to Elders past and present and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. So you don't want to hear too much from Kathleen um, or uh, Kate or myself. I think just the three of us are here. I don't think Robert's logged on. We're really grateful that the Balan crew who were going first put their hands up to present. And like I said in that little um, Facebook shout out, they could not have been more enthusiastic supporters of Reed Ballarat, always there in person, coming to share in best practice, supporting um, other presenters. So we're just thrilled that they are going to present for us. And I think it's still really important for us to hear those stories where schools are making these big moves from the way they have taught literacy or reading in particular into what we're all now sort of calling structured literacy. So we're really excited and here with a very supportive lens. That's what I said to them to cheer them on. So Roisin and Greer, are we right to hand over to you? Yeah, ready to go. Thanks, Sue. Thanks, Kathleen. And I will time and I'll just sort of, I'll maybe just let you know when we hit 15 and then yep. we'll yeah, we can definitely go a little bit longer, but we are just mindful we, yeah, we really want some questions at the end. Okay, we'll try to speak quickly. No, you're all, you're all fine. So I'm Roisin, I'm one of the Prep 1 teachers at Milan, and I've also been a literacy leader since 2019. And I'm Gria, and I'm one of the current Prep 1 teachers at Milan as well. So uh, Roisin and I started working together in prep in 2021 um, and it was a new experience for both of us in a way because Roisin had never taught prep uh, and I had never taught anyone how to teach prep and we started working together, started, you know, feeling out how we're going, uh, working with each other and we started to question a couple of practices that we had in place. Uh, we could see that some of the kids were learning and taking off, um, but there were still some that it just wasn't happening for. And I remember very clearly a conversation early on that Roisin and I had where she asked me, so how do we teach these kids to read? And I remember looking at her with a puzzled look on my face and just saying, I don't know. It just happens. It's like magic. And that's what I'd been told, like, wait for term three, that's the takeoff term. And it just all starts to click for them. And, you know, looking back now, it's like cringing and horrifying to go, shit, that's what I thought. Um, so we just started teaching, started teaching using the strategies that uh, we both knew. And yes, we did. We do cringe about them now. But during our planning time, we began talking a lot about wanting more structure. We both knew that there was sort of something that we were looking for that we didn't know what it was. For me, I kept talking about the recipe. I just wanted to know what the recipe was for teaching children how to read. And together we started talking to um, friends and family who were teachers. And I'm not, cr pretty sh not really sure which one of us it was, but one of us came across a podcast and that just began to change everything for us. So I'll just share my screen now. Hopefully you can all see that. Yes. Great. Um, so, yes, we started listening to podcasts. We started listening to all of the podcasts. Uh, the ones that are on the screen are some of our, like our top five, potentially. Um, and Roisin and I love sending a voice message to each other about anything and everything. And in that first term break, the April holidays, we were sending voice messages about all of the podcasts we were listening to, um, the like mind blowing ideas that were coming through, quotes like you have to listen to this one, I've just listened to this. Um, and we were starting to get ideas of what we could change. Um, and the, one of the, probably the first podcast that really got us hooked was the Right to Read Initiative podcast um, with Dr. Catherine Garforth. And she interviewed so many amazing people on that 
podcast, but the ones that really resonated with us and the ones that, yeah, we enjoyed probably the most were the ones with teachers um, because they were the people that were in the classrooms making these changes. Um, so, yeah, they were the ones that really got us hooked. And then from that, we were hearing a lot about phonics. We're like, okay, maybe this is the next step that we start to take. Um, There's a lot of talk about structure. So we downloaded a Teachers Pay Teachers Miss Learning B phonics pack, which by no means was perfect, but it was a step in the right direction. Um, so we started with that. The pack had PowerPoint slides, which means that we also had to change the way we were teaching. Uh, we were up the front a lot more, more whole class instruction. Many whiteboards became involved in the teaching. The kids were loving it and we were seeing a difference happening like almost overnight or so it felt. Um, so from there, we then realized we kind of needed to learn a bit more about the research behind how children learn to read. So we went to leadership and asked if we could do the Latrobe Uni Solar Lab course. Um, we were given the green light to go ahead and book into that. So we did the beginners course um, in 2021 and we knew we just needed to learn like the research behind how children learn to read. So we did the beginners course and then in 2022 we uh, signed up for the intermediate course as well. Um, and this kind of started opening up a whole new world to both Rishin and I. Uh, and part of that world was also Reed Ballarat. So Kathleen Williams uh, was the speech and language pathologist at our school. And we'd been picking her brain a little bit when she'd be on site and just, you know, talking to her about some of the changes we were making, what could we be doing? And she told us about this little group called Reed Ballarat and said that maybe we would like to join their Facebook page. And actually there was an event coming up soon that maybe we could attend. Um, so we signed up to the Facebook page and we signed up to our very first Reed Ballarat event. And that was with Reed, uh, no, not Reed Smith, James Dobson, sorry, James Dobson talking about fluency. Yeah. So if you ever get a chance to see James speak, absolutely grab it with both hands because he is incredible. He is so inspiring and we left that with our motors running and we were singing our sounds and we drove some of the one, two teachers absolutely crazy. Um, but while we were there listening to James, I just started to feel the overwhelm happening. We'd gone into one of the classrooms at um, Mount Pleasant Primary School beforehand and we'd seen some stuff that we'd loved and I could just feel it all coming in the overwhelm. And I said to James at the end, there was a question time and I asked him, where do we begin? And James's answer, he doesn't realize this, but it actually went to shape how we overhaul literacy in the juniors. Um, his answer was, you can only eat the elephant one bite at a time. And that just really resonated with me. So it didn't happen straight away, but I went and I sort of mulled over it a little bit. And I was at um, netball watching my daughter play one Saturday and I had a AirPod in my ear and I was listening to a podcast and I just got this thought in my head and I, of course, immediately sent Korea a voice message and said to her, what do you think of this? And she said, yep, yeah, I love it. So that afternoon I got home and I created our little mascot. Um, so this is Elmer. He is our one bite at a time mascot for how we are changing literacy. I'm, I'm saying it as our changing because we're still in the process. Um, because, uh, yeah, we're just doing it one bite at a time. We are two people who get very, very excited about things. And, um, you know, we can just charge ahead, but we turn around and we look behind and there's a whole team waiting back at the starting line. So we had to work out how we were going to do this change so that it was sustainable and that we different, didn't suffer from change fatigue. Um, so I paced out what I considered to be, um, you know, the ideal the exemplary sort of literacy um, in the prep to twos. And, you know, Elmer's changed a little bit from the very first one that I did, just as we sort of learned a few more things. And we brought it to our team and we started to just take on one bite at a time. Um, so some bites take a little longer than others. And, um, you know, some bites 
we were sort of like, you know what, we're doing that, we're doing it well, but let's maybe look at the research behind why we're doing it, not just sort of the fact that we're doing it. Um, for example, decodable readers, um, changing over the decod to decodable books from um, predictive texts, that took more than a term because we had to research which books we wanted. Uh, we had to get the green light from leadership to purchase these books. And thankfully, we just had a new principal come in who was very generous and gave us quite a bit of money to change over our books. And um, we had to research um, uh, how we were going to hand this over to families. So we had to create resources to retrain our families. We had to retrain our children uh, because, you know, instead of changing the book every night, we didn't want them changed every night because they had really quality resources. You know, we wanted them to have them for a few nights. We had to retrain our ES and even just cataloging the books took so much time. Um, and then we chose the time when we were going to going to roll it out. And we chose just before parent teacher interviews a couple of weeks before, so that when parent teacher interviews came about, we could just sort of clarify any misconceptions. But we didn't need to because the families were just absolutely over the moon. Families were happy, students were happy, teachers were happy, and you know we were able to color in that fight, and then as a team decide what our next fight was going to be. So the important thing to remember about something like <laughs> Elmer is, you know, there's a lot in there and actually a lot had to go. Um, so it's not about sort of putting stuff in, it's about choosing the things to take out as well. And I said to Bria that one day I should actually do a black and white Elmer where I fill in all the bits that we took out. Um, but honestly, at the moment, because we're still eating our elephant one bite at a time, we're looking forward and we're moving forward and I'm not looking back right now. Yeah. So on the screen, you'll see a whole lot of things, probably a little bit of an overload, um, but these are the schools that have helped us along our way. Um, we've been very fortunate to be welcomed into so many different classrooms. Um, and I know some people are on today, so thank you for having us in your rooms. Um, Roisin and I used our professional practice days to go and visit local schools and see prep teachers and their classes in action. And that was really exciting and just being able to go into a classroom that's a couple of years ahead of where we were on out like for our changes um, and seeing everything we'd been hearing about learning about actually happening um, was just really re reaffirming and showed us that we were on the right track. Um, so you'll also see that um, there are some resources up here that we've used. So there are a bunch of really great free resources um, that have definitely helped with the changes that we have made um, because we know, you know, budgets are tight, leadership says no to some things, um, but there are some high quality um, research backed um, resources available. So the spelled SA phonics, dibbles, ochre ed, Think Forward Educators, um, online events, core knowledge, UFLY, forms are all resources that we still use. And one of the biggest resources that has um, made a huge impact to us has been Read Ballarat, obviously. Um, so we were able to see these resources in action in the classrooms uh, and from there bring it back to our school and back into prep, make some changes and then share those changes with the rest of the Prep 2 team. Um, and then they've been enacted. And it's really exciting because now some of those changes are also filtering their way up through the whole school, um, which, yeah, it just shows that, you know, we are on the right track and more people are buying in, which is really great. So we love free resources. We love, love, love them. But along the way, we also paid for some things. Um, and these are some of the things that we paid for that we would probably say that we would go ahead and pay for again. Um, you know, one of the, the first fights that we took was getting consistent language with um, handwriting instruction. None of the junior teachers had ever been trained in handwriting instruction, and it was different depending on what room you went into. So we did Peggy Lego training with an OT, and she was brilliant. All of our ES did that as well, and that had a huge impact upon our children's, um, you know, cognitive load when it came time to writing. And uh, I must say, some of our preps have the best handwriting in the school. Um, we went to Murnion and we saw them using Hegarty. 
and for $175 a book, you couldn't get much more bang for your buck for developing phonological awareness. Uh, we're a sounds right trained um, team, which has really helped with teacher confidence and consistency. So that for us was very important. Um, we go to be sharing best practice every week, uh, every week, every week we go, we're that <laughs> dedicated. Every we go to sharing best practice um, every year. And um, that's just been incredible as was research ed this year. Uh, last year, Reed Smith taught us a lot about slides and the cognitive load of our slides. And Rhea and I looked at each other in horror because we knew our slides were not up to Reed Smith's um, expectations. So we went, and the thing is, the two of us have so much energy. So we went and we changed our slides straight away. Um, and we're so proud of them. They're so crisp and clean now. And um, we think Reed Smith would give them the tick. Uh, this year at Sharing Best Practice, um, Mina McLean was one of the keynote speakers, and she referenced a uh, Maya Angelou quote that is often used when talking about the changeover from balance to structured literacy, and that's when you know better, you do better. And she challenged it, and she said, you know, there's so much evidence in history to, to say that, no, we don't, we absolutely don't. But I must say, we could probably change that quote for Bria and I, because when we know better, we try to do better and we work darn hard in the process. Um, so Greer and I are really proud of the changes that we've made. We have, um, I think both worked very hard, but we've worked with, uh, you know, our professional learning team. We've worked with our action team. We have a great principal and an extremely supportive learning specialist who's an absolute champion of our bus and the work that we do and um you know we had so many schools open their doors to us that we said you know we would love to give back with a local story um and say how we did it and that if any school would like to come along and see us and how we do it the bland way you're more than welcome um i mean we're a little tired <laughs> it's long term um but you are more than welcome and that's us we're done oh my goodness I think, um, yeah, well, I'm so proud of you guys. I remember you coming to that James Dobson session. I remember that. That was, was the, yeah. So just quickly, some quick summaries there. Um, you were questioning, like, and how great the two of you met each other. I think it's just the journey can happen much quicker when you um, work on this with someone else. I always feel for those people who are trying to do this on their on their own. And I think there's something really special happens when you work well with a colleague, questioning things. And then I made a comment about podcasts, like how many of us are doing so much of our professional learning now um, through podcasts. And someone asked, you know, they're a pre-service teacher and asked where to start. So there are still people just coming onto this and who need you know which one which ones to start with yeah. um going to those knowledgeable others leadership support was obviously key for you guys and, and there's probably some people who are a little bit jealous of that because that's not always the case so that's obviously really helped you too you keep mentioning research and that just warms my heart that yeah. you yeah clearly challenging yourselves to be able to articulate why you're doing things and understand and be able to justify it which is amazing, bringing your team along. And I think that's really common. Um, people find that, yeah, you've got to look back and bring people with you. You can't always wait for everyone to catch up, no. but, but you can't race ahead um, and leave people behind. Engaging your families, I love that. And that's been my experience too, that families are usually just so delighted that their children are learning yeah. and, and they are fairly quick to get on board as long as you explain it to them. And I think that was a great tip changing things just before parent teacher interviews any other teacher that's thinking of the same thing that's a that's a really good tip i think that chance to explain it to them de-implementation what to take out is key it's not just what you bring in oh, yeah. to take yeah. out yeah. yeah yeah you can't we can't make that literacy block longer it's also what do we take out um your school visits have obviously been key and we've there's lots of people around the screen here that have been involved in those and we've worked really hard to build that culture in Ballarat that we that we want our doors open and if it's good practice we should all be doing it mm -hmm. um, and I'm just I'm thrilled that you guys are happy to offer that same thing so we'll be asking you to do <laughs> future school next year um, and 
something that just resonated to me when you just said none of the junior teachers have been trained in handwriting like how you know we were really let down we've been asked to do things that we just you know we weren't given the professional learning in so yeah we were winning it wasn't just handwriting but that was the example you guys used so um lots of people on here who need to hear that beginning journey people further along and we're going to hear from two people now who are a bit further along but that journey just resonates with everybody and I just love hearing it I, I don't think I will ever get sick of hearing teachers talking about yeah that that um move I don't know were you Kathleen I don't think we'll ever get sick of it um yeah, yeah it's just wonderful to hear so thank you so, so much thank and you before, yeah pop some questions in um the chat Kate's looking at the chat and also yeah definitely have some questions because what something I'd love to ask you at the end is yeah what were the pitfalls what what would you look back and say we didn't quite get that bit right because that's a great tip for someone else mm. now i think kelsey george we're going mm. to i'm looking around the screen for you you need to wave at me yes there you are I am so us, um, we're a plc school lucky enough at canadian lead to be a plc school and so we run um a really rigorous um professional learning community approach and they're all great, our PLC inquiry cycles, but this one really resonated with me because I think getting our students, you know, teaching phonics, even though it's tricky to, we think it's tricky to start with, really it's pretty simple because there's usually a scope and sequence to follow, but getting our students over that bridge from phonics to fluency is absolutely key. And knowing when to give them a little push, um, how to get them off decodables, and again, um, like our Balan girl shared, understanding the research behind that. So Kels, this is really a team project, but Kels is just going to present on behalf of her team um, what we learnt about moving st students from phonics to fluency. Over to you, Kels. Thank you, Sue. Um, yeah, so what you see on the slide and what Sue said is what I'm going to go through. Um, so just a quick little background about our school. Some people might have come out to see us um, with recent visits. We've got about 210 students across 11 classrooms. Lots of our students come from disadvantaged families. Um, on the My School website last year, we've got an ICSIA value of 958, which puts us in the 28th percentile. Um, we would say that we are trying to teach in a structured literacy way. We're definitely not nailing everything, but we are trying really hard and working really hard on that. And like Sue said, we're obviously a PLC link school as well. So that's what I'm gonna take you through today. Um, really quickly, this is what uh, the one, two classrooms literacy or week looks like. Um, so you can see across each day there what we get through. So we teach using a systematic synthetic phonics program, which is based on the UFLY sequence. And it's a sort of mix of OG MSL lesson structure. We use a mix of core knowledge language arts units and other study author study or novel units um, in our literacy block. Um, so that's where we're teaching sort of comprehension, we're reading aloud to students, vocab happens um, in there. We use the writing revolution techniques quite heavily. Um, we use story champs in the junior end of the school as core resources to explicitly teach writing. And you can see the little purple spots there across our timetable. We do fluency pairs four times a week. So in regards to this um, inquiry cycle, what had we noticed that started us thinking about fluency? We'd done our mid-year testing and we had a surprising number of students in year one and year two who weren't showing that six month growth in reading. And we were particularly looking at um, oral reading fluency rates. So we used eyeballs to assess our students. We had a wider than ideal range of oral reading fluency scores. And what we found a little bit interesting was that most of those year ones who were scoring a bit behind had actually reached all their end of year benchmarks in prep. So we we're sort of wondering what's happened between end of prep to mid grade one where they haven't kept that progress up. Uh, so for this inquiry cycle, we chose to focus on those year one and year two students who hadn't made six month growth in reading and they also had below benchmark oral reading fluency scores. And lots of those were now sitting six to 12 months below standard. So they weren't our sort of students sitting in tier three who were potentially 18 months behind. They were those ones that we thought were our gettable students. They just needed a bit of a push. Um, so in a PLC inquiry cycle, you probably know we had, um, come up with a SMART goal that we want to focus on. This was ours for our one twos. So over a four week period, we wanted those target students 
to increase their words per minute scores by at least 12. Um, and we were measuring that on the Dibble's oral reading fluency progress monitoring passages. And we were gonna do that um, by having those students participate in a small group with us four times a week. So during those fluency pairs spots, um, it was only about 10 minutes per day. So we'd come up with that, we had our students, we knew what we wanted them to do, but then obviously we needed to think how were we gonna get them there. This was where we were sort of a little bit, not baffled, but we were sort of wondering, what do we do about this? We thought we were teaching our systematic synthetic phonics program. We were, we thought we can tick that off, we're doing that. We do daily review of previously taught skills. Um, so we were doing space practice, interleave practice, we did fluency pairs four times a week. It was happening in our one, two classrooms. We were using decodable text quite heavily. Um, certainly in our prep classrooms, that's what students were reading. And we had quite a few grade ones and even grade two still reading decodable texts. This was all sort of a little bit confusing because our less data, um, if you haven't seen that, it's where students look at a grapheme and say the phoneme and our distant data. So that's a nonsense word spelling test that data was actually quite strong. So we were sort of a bit confused that our phonics data was looking good, but our oral reading fluency data was not as strong. So I had a bit of a hunch we needed to focus on what we were asking students to read and potentially we needed to get them reading something different. So we were focusing on the text that we were gonna ask students to read. Um, so as part of an inquiry cycle, you always do some professional learning. Um, for this inquiry cycle, I decided to have my team all read the same text so that we were building that shared knowledge together and that we could discuss what we were reading and know what everyone else was talking about. So the first one we looked at was this on the screen. So the power of continuous blending. How do we use connected phonation to support decoding? Um, you might have heard of this already. Basically, connected phonation is a decoding or a word reading strategy that teaches students to stretch out continuous sounds to support their blending. So basically, we're asking students to not stop between the sounds. So there should be, sorry, an example there. So reading a simple word like sap, um, we would get students to say s, a, p, and then blend the sounds together but we've all probably had that experience where students will say s, a, p, pot, and they come up with something completely different and you think, no, you've just said the sounds, what's the word? So connected phonation is when we prompt students to keep their voice on and to not put that pause between the sounds. So in, they would say s, a, p, without the pause, and it just helps them uh, remember, as it says there, um, they're less likely to forget the beginning sound of the word, um, that they're reading and they're more likely to decode that word accurately. So the key takeaways for us were pretty simple. We just wanted to go back and check our term one prep phonics lessons, making sure that we've included words in those lessons that actually have continuous sounds. Um, so words like sap s, is a continuous sound, uh, a word like top t, is a stop sound. So you can't actually continue it and stretch it out. It's not that that's not a great word to use, but just when we're teaching that connected um, blending, we wanna make sure we've got those continuous sounds. Um, we did some observations of teachers. So I do some coaching and another couple of our teachers do some coaching of our junior teachers. Um, we wanted to make sure that we are prompting students to keep their voice on in those phonics lessons when they're reading words. And it was also just a good reminder for us uh, when we're reading individually with students, our prompt needs to be, keep your voice on, say the sounds, keep your voice on, and blend those sounds together. Um, and that worked really well with lots of our students who were struggling with that. The next professional reading we did was from the Five from Five website, which is a great resource. And it was about the self-teaching hypothesis. So I'm just gonna read straight from the screen. The self-teaching hypothesis proposed by David Sher is the idea that once students, uh, once learners have established their knowledge of grapheme phoneme correspondences, and the essential process of segmenting, so breaking up sounds and blending them back together, they begin to apply this knowledge to new and novel words. Uh, so there's an example there. Let's imagine that we've taught students the word look, maybe we've taught it as an irregular word quite early on in prep. They know then that the two O's spell the oop sound. In theory, they then could apply that knowledge 
to unknown words like book, took, foot, because they've learnt that double O sound in one word, they can then use it and apply it to new and novel words. Um, David Sher is talking about the idea that as an adult, we know about 50,000 words. It's in our sight word vocabulary. Teachers can't possibly teach that many words at school. So our brains rely on this self-teaching. Once we know enough of the code, we can then use that knowledge to decode unknown words. So the key takeaways for us were, it says very clearly, you absolutely must teach phonics and letter sound correspondences explicitly. That has to happen. We also must teach blending sounds together as the number one strategy for decoding. So students have to keep their eyes on the text. They're not looking at pictures. They're not guessing from context. Phonics and sounding out words is the number one strategy. This was really important for us. Students don't need to know all their letter sound correspondences before they can attempt regular text. By regular text, I'm talking about something that's not strictly decodable. Um, once students know enough letter sound correspondences, this is where it gets a little bit messy because there's not a definite point in a sequence where you can say, well, in term three, week five, they don't need decodables, they can go to regular text. It's not that cut and dry. Um, but in that article, the author suggested it's probably once they've been taught the VCE pattern, so um, split digraph, bossy E, silent E, whatever you call it, or other long vowel sounds, most students, provided all those other core skills are happening, the blending, segmenting, phonics skills, most students could then start attempt to read regular texts and move away slowly from those decodable texts. So our wondering then was, students should therefore be having some exposure to simple regular texts in order to develop those self-teaching skills. If we are just constantly feeding them a diet of decodable books that they can read fairly easily, they're not having to use those phonics skills to decode novel and unfamiliar words. So we were starting to think perhaps we need to be adding in some more regular text to their reading. Uh, the last reading we did was this one. So it's called What is Set for Variability? It's actually a transcript of a podcast um, between Dr. Marnie Ginsberg and um, an American. The website is The Measured Mum. You might have heard of that. So it was an interview between that person and Dr. Marnie Ginsberg. She was discussing this concept called Set for Variability. So that is a skill that a reader uses to transform a pronunciation error or a mispronunciation into the correctly decoded form of the word. So I'll give you an example. Um, a student is reading, they don't know the word down, they haven't read it before. They might say, do, o, wu, n, don, but then straight away they go, oh, down. You've probably had that experience with students. It's often with um, words with vowel sounds in them. Let's say the word was take, they'll say, to, a, k, tak, or oh, take. And they just immediately flip it themselves and correct. That's them using their set for variability skills. So in that um, podcast, Dr. Ginsburg suggests that there could actually be three steps to decoding words. So first students use their letter sound knowledge to sound out the word. They blend the sounds back together. Hopefully then they've pronounced the word correctly and they move on. Potentially though they might mispronounce the word, we then want them to use those set for variability skills if they can to correct themselves and match that mispronunciation to a word that they know that is the correct pronunciation. So the key takeaways for us were, again, we absolutely have to teach letter sound correspondence explicitly, along with those skills of blending and segmenting. Oops, sorry, I've missed a spot there. Students must use their decoding skills to get a first attempt at a pronunciation, even if it's incorrect. So we always, always want students to say the sounds, read the word, give it a try first, because even if they mispronounce the word, those students with those strong set for variability skills are often then able to just make that quick switch and they'll fix themselves and they'll keep going. Um, obviously, students do need strong oral language skills and vocabulary knowledge in order to have a potential match in their oral vocabulary to match that mispronunciation too. So our wondering then again was, in theory, we thought it would be helpful to give students exposure to unfamiliar words in order to continue developing those set for variability skills. They're potentially not going to develop those skills as quickly if we're just constantly feeding them a diet of very easily decodable words where they say the sounds, they read it, they're done. 
Now, I just want to say, I'm not saying this for like beginning readers, beginning readers absolutely need decodable books. I'm talking sort of towards the end of prep. Once students are really confident with those skills, we've got to start stretching them onto some other things. Um, we also thought then that there's a connection maybe between set for variability skills and your self teaching ability and one would influence the other, provided that you're getting some exposure to unfamiliar words. So, how did we do this? Um, this is an example of over a week what we did. So, we would do whole class two minutes all together, practice some irregular words, and I'll show you on the next slide what that looked like. Then we, the teachers, would have their focus students in front of them with a regular text. We purposely chose a text that was not simply decodable. Um, the first day, we would echo read one sentence at a time. The second day, we would choral read one sentence at a time. And then on day three and day four, students would sit and independently read that text for one minute, mark where they got to, do that two more times and mark where they got to. So it was sort of like a little competition with themselves to try and get a bit further each time. And we would record their highest score on a tracking sheet. So students were seeing week to week that little dot go higher and higher because they were reading more words each week. So that was a bit of motivation for them. Uh, this is an example of what that irregular word practice looked like. So we would have the word friend would appear, we'd correlate read that all together, and then the sentence would appear underneath and we'd correlate read that together as well. We just flick through, I don't know, probably 20 to 30 words each time really quickly. Then this is an example of the text that we were getting students to read. Um, you can see that they're not strictly decodable, but they're not very difficult either. So we wanted to just start them on some simple regular texts that weren't going to be too overwhelming. Um, and I've just put up there, they come from that Wonders Fluency Assessments. If you Google that, someone's very nicely put a PDF um, up on the internet. You can just download it yourself. And there's text from grade one to grade six. It is American, so some of them aren't quite appropriate for Australia, but most of them are fine. So the important part is our results. So these are our year one results. Um, so that first column there, the start of cycle data, that was our mid-year um, oral reading fluency data from Dibbles. And then the end of cycle was just after that four weeks of 10 minutes a day, four times a week practice. And then in the last column, we've recorded how many increase or decrease of words per minute they got. Particularly with the year ones, we were really, really pleased. There's lots of students there who had huge increases, like 20, 30, 40 words increase over four weeks, which was amazing. Keeping in mind our goal was 12. We wanted them to improve 12 words per minute and lots of them have surpassed that. Um, this is our year twos. So some strong results, again, not quite as strong as the year ones, but they sort of started um, some of them at a higher point. Um, there's a couple there that didn't quite get the progress we wanted to, but that was sort of in line with previous results for them. They were quite up and down and inconsistent. Um, and I know one of those students at least is in our intervention program. So has some extra needs and works on things um, with our intervention teacher. So overall 15 out of 20 students achieved our goal. And you can see quite a few students increased by over 20 words per minute. Um, if you're using Dibbles as well, you know that sort of year to year, the average increase is 30 to 40 words ish over a year. So those students that increased over 20 words per minute, they're almost getting a six month increase in four weeks of teaching time. And the main difference that we used was just moving them onto some simple regular texts and us reading it with them, that echo reading and choral reading to start with to sort of scaffold them onto those texts. So what is next for us? We are looking very carefully at how we're using decodable texts. I don't want anyone to go away and think Kelsey thinks decodable texts are bad. That's absolutely not what I'm saying. Decodable texts are 100% what beginning readers should be reading. Absolutely. When you want them to practice those letter sound um, skills, their blending skills, decodable texts are perfect for that. There is a time, though, if your students are confident with those skills of using their phonics knowledge, blending and segmenting, there's a point where we need to give them a little bit of a push onto those simple regular texts. Um, our, one of our prep teachers had come to me and said, oh, I'm just not quite sure. I think I could try a simple text with this student and this student. And she tried it and she came back and she was like, oh, my goodness, they actually surprised me. 
and they did it really easily. So I think I'm actually going to try it with this one and this one too. So we've moved quite a few of our preps now onto some just simple regular text because they don't need that decodable anymore. The decodable has done its job, which is perfect, but we don't need it anymore. We want to push them onto reading some more regular texts. Um, exactly that. Moving on to simple regular texts where possible. There's obviously situations and students where this is not going to work and they'd absolutely need those decodables for a bit longer. That's fine. But where possible, maybe give some a little bit of a push and move them on. Um, obviously, we want to make sure that that connected phonation is embedded um, in our phonics lessons. The one twos especially, we hadn't done a whole lot of echo reading and choral reading in our fluency pairs, and that's something that we're going to put in place more regularly now. And we also are sort of refining the prompts that we give to students while decoding. So we always, always want to make sure that we ask the student to sound it out and then wait. They need to blend the sounds together, even if they do get a mispronunciation, those set for variability skills might kick in and they'll be able to fix it themselves. That's ideal. If they don't, we're then just giving them a specific sound prompt. So potentially in a word, there might be OU and they haven't learned that OU can spell OW. So we would just point out in the word, oh, OU says OW, try that there. But then they have to go back and say the sounds and blend them together. Um, that is all. So those are just the resources. Um, I'm happy to share my slides later if you want. Those are resources and I just popped one at the bottom from um, Tim Shanahan's blog. He's got a really interesting blog on decodable text and the research behind them. And yeah, it's just a very interesting read and might sort of influence how you use decodables at your school. But that's all from me. Awesome, Kels. Thank you so much. Um, I think there potentially might be lots of requests for that to be a much longer pres um, presentation so people can kind of really get their heads around that. And I could just see from people's body language how intently they were listening. I've heard it before and I was listening just as intently. I think to get 95% of our students at and above standard at the end of year six, which is what we're all aiming for, 95% literacy, what we do in year one is absolutely key. I think a lot of us, and what we do with those students sitting in tier two is key, I think. And that's what you show there, how we approach our tier two students and what supports we give them. You will have got most of those into tier one. Many of those students will have moved up into tier one. And then and then we really know who are those um, students needing those tier three supports. Yep. And I think just made me think about um, what the Belang girl said about teacher professional learning in terms of handwriting, look at the professional learning we need to work with our most vulnerable students, that if they're not getting that in in that year one, we know it will take four times as long if we let those students move up into years three and four um, without catching up to their peers. It will take four times as long and maybe they don't ever. So um, yeah, really exciting thing for you to share and great example of the level of expertise that you bring um, to teaching, which is so impressive. And Steph, a kind of sidestep maybe a little bit further up. I think of morphology as being something that it is really important for teachers in three to six, especially if their students come in decoding beautifully um, because they've had really good teaching in um, F12. And I know you've got, the first time you presented for us, it was around um, vocab. And again, I, I just see morphology, the more I learn about teaching, reading and writing, um, and decoding multi-syllabic words, the more important I realise morphology is. So we're really excited to hear from you. Thanks, Steph. Thanks, Sue. So I'll just share my screen in just a moment. So that appears. Sorry, are you able to see that? Perfect. Okay, make a start. I'm really conscious of the time, so I'll keep moving as much as I can. So I'm Steph Sanders, and I'm from Wodea Lake Primary School, and this is my second year there. Um, and I'm current in, currently in a campus head and learning specialist role, particularly working on school improvement um, in the area of literacy. And recently, in the last few years, I've been teaching in the middle and senior area. So today, I'm going to be speaking about morphology. So my school, I think like so many schools at the moment, is currently transitioning from that sort of previous approach with sort of elements of balanced literacy towards a structured literacy approach. And we've had a huge amount of success 
particularly within the junior team. They've been working for many years um, and we've now embedded a lot of those elements within our junior instruction. So that brings us to the point in time I'm going to talk about, which is last year in term four, so a little bit earlier, a little bit more than 12 months ago. And the literacy sit at uh, my school, which is made up of teachers, um, really wanted to build off the success that was happening within the juniors and try and think about how we can include this with our three to six team in a way that wasn't overwhelming for our teachers in term four. So as um, Gria and Rasheen said earlier, this was our one bite of the elephant for our three to six team in term four last year. Um, and it was decided that morphology could really build on the phonics approach that was currently, or at that point was being used within our junior team, which was Sounds Right, um, and build off that momentum in a way that would provide a bridge for those seniors from their current practices for the teachers in the middles and the seniors towards looking at incorporating elements of the science of learning, science of reading, structured literacy, all that sort of um, knowledge that we've been discussing. So the reason that we chose morphology was that we really wanted to build teacher knowledge. So all teachers at that point had trained in Sounds Right. And we viewed morphology a little bit as a low hanging fruit, we called it. And we felt that we could upskill teachers really quickly um, and get it into classrooms and happening basically on the ground. We also were looking into the importance of morphology, particularly um, as a key, morphology as a key um, to vocabulary. So we know how important vocabulary is for reading instruction. Um, so understanding that morphology can help so much with our tier two and three words, um, particularly relating all those words that are relating to science. So have those common roots. So that was sort of our thinking behind um, why morphology was the right choice at that particular point in time as a bit of a first step um, for our three to six teachers. So our steps, what did we do? So we decided to run two PD sessions as a literacy sit um, as a group. And we began by really sharing and celebrating the work of the junior team. Those teachers have been so dedicated for so many years, doing all the things that have been discussed tonight. So we really took a moment to celebrate that. Next, we had a really strong focus on developing teachers' understanding. So we felt that there's so many incredible resources, even more so now than there was 12 months ago that were available. Um, and to quote Amina McLean, which many of us have tonight, clearly <laughs> all fangirls of Amina McLean, um, we cannot teach what we do not know. So it's the importance of teachers having that knowledge, particularly with these fantastic, really high quality resources around the importance of still teachers having that understanding um, to effectively teach, particularly morphology. Um, I personally have had to develop my knowledge in morphology. It wasn't something that was really covered at uni for me. Um, or in my own schooling. So I had to develop that knowledge, so we tried to take the team on that journey as well. In the second session, which I've got down the bottom there, we really moved to exploring some of the resources that the Literacy SIT um, had selected, and we predominantly worked with the Reading Science in Schools Morphology Scope and Sequence as a starting point. Um, and then we had staff plan some sessions based around those. Um, and now <laughs> that we've sort of moved forward, we've moved to towards using the Morphology Project lessons, which are fantastic, found on the Grammar Project and OCA Education, which I know has been mentioned, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But ultimately, our aim was building teacher knowledge and having morphology explicitly taught in a systematic way. So year on year, making sure that we were building that knowledge exactly like we had been with our phonics, with our S1s and 2s. Okay, so what did our teacher PD look like? I'm going to spend my time today that I have been so generously allocated um, sharing what our initial teacher PD looked like. So as I've said, there's so many great resources. Um, this was just a way that we really built our teacher knowledge. So this was the content on the screen that we covered in the first session. And I'm just going to share some snippets today that potentially might be interesting to you um, or if you're taking a team on a similar journey, this was the knowledge that we covered. So I thought potentially it could be useful. And I need to say I'm by no means an expert in this area. This is just some of the knowledge that I've developed. I highly recommend, I've actually got it here with me, Unlocking Literacy by Marsha Henry. This is where I've done a lot of my learning as well as all the other fantastic resources um, that are around. 
So this is, I think, a really fantastic stretch here. It's from How Words Cast a Spell. And you might notice um, Louisa Moat, she also wrote um, Speech Print, which is a great book as well. Um, I'm not going to read it to you. I just want to point out a few things. So the first is spelling is a window into what a person knows. I think this is so key in that for me personally, I really enjoy analysing student spelling. It can tell you so much about their point of need, where they're at developmentally, what their next step needs to be, even from a few months into foundation throughout to grade six and beyond high school. For me, often with, if we're doing some sort of spelling test or assessment, it's not so much what they got right or wrong, but for me, how they got something incorrect. It can be used to help us sort of diagnose where they're at. So have they missed a syllable if we're looking at the word stopped? Have they got the double P or have they placed a T at the end instead of the verb suffix ED? It can tell us so much about where they're at and what their next steps need to be. Also in that second paragraph, I just wanted to point out, so teaching patterns in English spelling needs to be that systematic and explicit approach. So breaking it down and teaching it in small steps, just like we know that's good teaching. That's what we're doing, I think, now in so many areas of the curriculum. So we talked about how English has changed over many years and that students need to understand this and how looking at history briefly um, can explain how and why these variations have occurred. So we've got um, Anglo-Saxon, Latin, Greek, as well as so many modern layers. So something we talked about really briefly was just an example of the Anglo-Saxon groups that invaded what we now call England from Europe. Um, and many of our common English words nowadays orient originate sorry, from the Anglo-Saxon language. So those functional words, things like bed, cup, fish. Um, I won't go into the other elements, um, but I highly recommend if you pop it into YouTube, there's some really fantastic little clips that make it super easy to understand. There's lots of invading that occurs, but just for students understanding how the English language has actually developed over time. Um, and there's also a good chapter in Unlocking Literacy that's helpful as well. And having this knowledge for our students and for our teachers um, can help us identify the origins of words in English according to their spellings. So for example, if we see um, Y representing the it sound in a word, we know that that word is from Greek origin. So for example, myth or gin, it's not randomly there, it's there for a reason, um, and history can tell us how that has come about. So this is another fantastic um, model that I've used a lot in the past. Again, it's from that Unlocking Literacy. I'm really plugging that tonight, the book. Um, but this one's a really useful model. Um, so it's Decoding, Spelling and Vocabulary Instruction, often called DSV. And I really like how it shows how this instruction can fit together over time. I think Sue said before, if we have that really great foundation from F1-2, then looking at what can we build on next in three to six. And it's cumulative. We're always reviewing what's come before and building on. So in grade three, really starting to dig into those prefixes and suffixes. And then as we move through, looking at Latin roots and Greek combining forms. And you notice on this, it goes all the way through to year eight, and I would say probably and beyond for a lot of students too. Of course, it's developmental, so you'd introduce different things at different times, depending on the needs of particular students. But I think it's a really useful snapshot. So some definitions. Um, this is something we talked about. I wouldn't use this with students, but I think it's really good for teachers to be able to break these up in their mind. So looking at phonology, which is thinking about sounds, orthography, how we represent those sounds, morphology, breaking up words into their parts and looking at the structure according to meaning. Um, so morphemes here I've popped on are defined as the smallest meaningful unit. And then etymology, which I'll be honest, holds a special place in my heart. I quite like etymology, um, looking at the origins of words. So my absolutely favourite example of this that I use all the time is the word cupboard. It is not a random P that's been placed in there. It actually has to do with um, the origin of the word. So the pronunciation has changed, but it used to be in houses or in you know many years ago, there would be a board that people would hang cups on or a board that you would stick your cups on. Over time, we've just replaced doors on those and the look of it has changed. Um, However, that spelling has stayed the same, cupboard, that used to be a cup board. And I think once students understand where this language comes from, um, it can really support them in terms of their spelling and their ability to understand words. So pronunciation change, but same spelling. And I've put down the bottom there, I both said ology, but ology it technically is, um, means study of. You can see many of those have that within it. So it's a study of those particular things, different lenses, I suppose, to look at words through. 
Um, so next up is just looking at the conceptual difference between phonological decoding, so looking at the sounds within words, um, and morphological decoding, so dividing according to the meaning. And I just thought I'll show you an example um, biography here. If you're working with young students, you would um, decode according to individual sounds, but here I've just used syllabification, so biography. Then we can put our morphemic lens over that, our morphology lens, and have a look at, okay, what can we see here in terms of meaning? Bio is a Greek root meaning life, and graph, um, as Kelsey was talking about before, graphene, um, is Greek root meaning writing. So life, writing, we've got a Y at the end, that noun forming suffix, what could that mean if you ask students thinking about biography, writing about our own life? Um, and as Kelsey said before, I know this is not exactly the same, but that self-teaching hypothesis, the idea that students have those webs of knowledge. So if we know those things, then we could look at autobiography. If auto means self, then what does that mean? Or biology, well, we just learnt before that that means study of, and bio means life, so study of life. So you can see for students, these webs start to occur where they can join this knowledge together. <laughs> Um, so this one is just a really simple um, slide. So all words are built from morphemes um, and pronunciation changes just like covered before, but often that spelling stays the same based on the base of the word. So sign, resign and signature. Different pronunciation but same spelling based on the meaning, understanding the morpheme within that word. Um, we often talk about affixes in terms of an umbrella term, so it includes our prefixes, which are attached at the beginning of the base, and the suffixes, which are attached after the base, or sometimes a suffix might be added to another suffix. And it's stylized with the line showing where it attaches um, to the base or to another suffix. And often we can add more than one suffix. This is something we as a team talked about. So for example, excitedly, we've got excite, ed, and lead. So we've got that ed and ly, where ly is being added to another suffix. So we just found as a team, people had lots of different knowledge of these things, but we wanted to break it down into a really simple way where everything is connected as much as possible. We also talked about inflectional compared to derivational um, morphology, and these are applied primarily to the suffixes that we were looking at. So the idea that derivational actually shifts the part of speech. So quick is an adjective, however quickly, when we add the suffix ly, um, becomes an adverb. And I would talk about with my students how this would function differently within the sentence, given that we've changed the part of speech or the word class there. Um, inflectional does not change the part of speech, so that's purely um, from a grammatical lens or a grammatical perspective. And I always think about these in terms of it affects verbs, so looking at tense, it looks at nouns with plurals and possessives, and also adjectives with the two different forms that we can add. So inflectional doesn't change the part of speech, derivational does. And this was another one we touched on because I think all of these terminology is often used, so we tried to break it down as much as possible. So the idea that a free base can stand alone, like the word kind, however, a bound base only appears as part of the larger word. So struck doesn't make sense by itself, however, structure does. I really like this recap and we've used this as a school a little bit from the Department of Education. It just breaks down all those things that we talked about. So we made a cheat sheet for staff um, that included this on it in terms of so we all had the same reference point and we all had shared understanding and language. I'm going to move to the next section quite quickly. Um, here were some affixes that we looked at to teach to our F2. So predominantly we looked at morphology from grades uh, 3 onwards. However, there were some elements that we could drip feed into F2. Um, so this image is from William Byrne Cleave, and I've got the reference at the end for it. Um, and this, a lot of these slot really nicely alongside phonics approaches. Um, and it's also mostly inflectional, so related to grammar in that way. And we use this as an entry point for some of our older students. So if you've got students who have never heard um, of morphology before or been exposed to it, we found that these were a really nice entry point for them. And for teachers that are beginning teaching it for the first time, these were a really great way to start. Particularly, I find a lot of those inflectional ones we're teaching with our EAL students or students um, that might have some different difficulties because they need to be taught those explicitly in terms of their speech. So this is something I've come across reasonably recently, and that is morphological awareness, or I've also seen it written morphemic awareness. 
So the idea that we have phonemic awareness, we talk about that a lot, thinking about the sounds within words. The idea that we need to build and teach the same awareness and understanding is morphemes within words. So here are a range of different ways that that could happen. So sorting words based on the base or the root, um, looking at word detectives, so identifying those within words, um, building them, so giving them a suffix or a prefix um, or a root, and they have to build different words. And then etymology investigation, which is great if you've got a novel study or something, getting students to do a little bit of research. But I'd highly recommend providing the words. I've had students do it before and they seem to always pick a bit of a dud, which makes it quite boring. So making sure you're providing some really interesting words. Here are a few different activities, and I have sourced all of these from William Ben Cleave. There's a lot of fantastic research. Um, different resources available. I just thought I'd whip through a couple very quickly in terms of that morphemic awareness. So a morpheme matrix is something I use all the time with students and us as a staff use quite a bit, particularly for revision. So just the idea that we have our prefixes on one side, we have our base in the middle, and then we have the suffixes on the other side. So the inflectional at the top and derivational at the bottom. So it's basically helping our students to understand that morphemes are the building blocks of words. So we say to students, you know, how many possible words can you find here? We might talk about the fact that they've possibly added more than one suffix um, and how that has altered the word. Looking at the time, I'm not going to talk through these. These are just a few more. So looking at the difference between phoneme and morphology counting, and we would do this with students. Looking, underlining the base word and boxing up the prefixes and suffixes. This is all building that morphemic awareness and sorting words according to their morphemes. And these would always be morphemes that we explicitly taught. So, in terms of building morphemic awareness, I've come across this as well. We use SoundSlight um, at my school, so we use SoundSwap. SoundSwap, sorry, we're looking at that phonemic um, manipulation. So, just the idea that we can do the exact same thing with morphology, I'll be honest, blew my mind a little bit. Um, the idea that um, it can just be an oral activity. And when I did this with my students, I was surprised at how easily they could do it because of that teaching that we've done around morphology. Um, and then there's that really strong link in terms of how does morphology feed into spelling patterns or affect spelling. So we've talked about it in terms of vocabulary, understanding those parts, um, but this is another area as well that it feeds into. And I always use spelling pattern really intentionally, just because with spelling rules, there's often more exceptions than not. So instead we're focusing on generalizing. What patterns can we see when we look at these words? Um, and I've just popped those three on the screen because they have such high utility, these particular um, spelling patterns. And I've used the language drop the E because it aligns with our junior approach. I think it was Kelsey maybe that said before, it's you know, sometimes magic E, bossy E, there's a lot of different terminology for it. But this was the terminology we decided to use as a school just because it built on that previous understanding that students have. So I'm going to talk you through an example very quickly. So this is the two adjective suffixes. And this is inflectional morphology. It is not changing the word class. So er being added to the end comparative, so meaning more, so big er. And s is the superlative form, which means most, big s. So you might do something like this with students. Then you add er or est to the base word, so add those suffixes. And then identify um, the base word within the underlined words. And then we can start to look at some of these patterns and everything that's involved within them. So adding the suffixes er and est, they begin with a vowel. So therefore, if there is one syllable, one single vowel letter and one final consonant letter, we double the final consonant. This was something I did starting with my grade threes. So let's look at the word big, it's one syllable, yes. It has one single vowel letter i and one single consonant letter g. So therefore, we need to double. And there's a lot of different versions of this particular one kicking around. This is from Lynn Stone's um, Spelling for Life. I've got the book still on my desk. Um, and I find this was really easy for the students I've taught to grasp. But I know others use um, lax and tense vowel um, when making these choices. So it's about sometimes, I think, looking at the different options in terms of ways to teach it and selecting what's going to suit your students best based on their knowledge. And then here is just an example of what this might look like with our students. And this is what we talked through as a staff, this particular example. So we talked through big, but if you look at the word kind, so it's one syllable and there's one single vowel letter. However, there's two consonants at the end. So when we're adding our adjective suffixes, we do not double the final consonant. 
So I just thought with morphology, I wanted to talk through how it links to vocabulary, but also how it links to spelling as well. So here are some of the resources. I really like the William Van Cleen thing. They're all pretty much freely available. I think he really sadly passed away somewhat recently, but there's a PDF I've linked there that's available online and they're the screen grabs that I've inserted. Yoshimoto has some great word lists. Department of Education occasionally has some interesting things <laughs> um, and lots of great resources for you to access. Um, reading Science in School, the Morphology Scope and Sequence, I think that is the most recent one that I've put in there. Obviously, a huge amount of people have done wonderful work on that. Um, the Grammar Project, or the Morphology Project, which is also now available through OCA. So they have lessons and units that you can just pick up and teach. That was what I was talking about um, with all those fantastic resources. I've popped that article in there that I spoke about earlier, and that Unlocking Literacy by Marsha Henry is fantastic too. This is my very last slide. These were our key takeaways for me, but for also us as a staff. So the idea that there are incredible resources around, but that we need to have um, the knowledge as teachers to underpin those. So to help us to select the resources, there are so many, so deciding what's quality and what will suit our particular students or what will suit our instructional models um, in what is quite a really changing landscape we thought was important but also so that we can not just take these resources and prompt them in classes, but how, how we can alter them to suit our group groups or interact with students when we're teaching them um, or even deciding at what point to start that instruction. So that teacher knowledge, I personally think is absolutely key and we found it to be really important. The second is the importance of explicitly teaching that morphine knowledge or morphology knowledge. Um, and systematically over time. And I would so love to be that person that only taught it in context in these amazing moments, but ultimately I've found for it to be systematic, it needs to follow a scope and sequence over time in terms of giving the students that knowledge, just like the teachers. So that then that third one, I think is really where the magic happens, embedded instruction within content. So applying that morphology knowledge to words in the context, in content, sorry, so analysing, noticing, wondering, we have those really rich discussions as the class, as a class, um, when the teacher and the student all have that knowledge to really interact and comprehend um, these amazing words in different contexts. So that is the end of me. I'm so sorry I was so quick. I had an extra slide, but hopefully I made it with not too much extra time. No, you did beautifully. I had my timer on every time and because I was listening to all three presentations so intently, it scared the life of me out of me, like every time it went off three times. Steph, you are such a, um, you're such a word nerd. Like I just love it. I think as I think of you with that rich knowledge of vocab and now with, um, yeah, morphology, I feel like, I don't know, it's that name Steph too. I was just thinking like a Ballarat Steph Livia. That's what you like for us. Um, really resonated with me you saying um, teachers can't teach what they don't know and you can give a teacher a program but unless you have that really strong knowledge underneath it's it's not going to work as well so I loved you talking about that also that you built on the successes the school already had when we think about change management in a school rather than saying here's yet another thing we're not doing and that we've got to add in let's first celebrate what we're doing well and what is the version of what what is phonics in three to six? Well, it's morphology and spelling. That, that's what it is. And I love that you said it's a bridge. You know, it's like a bridge between spelling and vocab morphology. Um, and English is complex and we, we need that knowledge. And I think that's something we have all been lacking ourselves. A nice shout out to William Van Cleef. Lots of people who are experts in this area, like you mentioned him. And I know we can still get his resources, but it is, he, he did run great PD and I missed that too. So um, yeah, it was great to see him get a great um, shout out. And I loved your three just key takeaways that build teacher knowledge first. And you've obviously put a huge amount of time into doing that yourself personally, teach it explicitly, but then you've got to um, apply it within, con you know, within the context. So that was yeah really great information for us. Some nice shout outs there. Um, Kate, you would have been, there's lots of thank yous in there, I know, but is there any questions? Anyone can just unmute themselves and ask a question and Kate might have a couple that are